Good morning. Welcome to the New Zealand Red Cross Recovery Program Overview. I am Vinci Belante, the Red Cross Earthquake Recovery Advisor, and I'm here to talk about how Red Cross has been operating in, in Greater Christchurch for the recovery phase after the Canterbury earthquakes. This morning is to give an overview of all the various activities Red Cross has been involved with. So we all know the event that occurred back in February 22nd in 2011, where we had all of the statistics shown. We had the deaths, we had 100,000 homes with no sewage, 37,000 homes with no power, we had 150,000 tons of liquefaction moved. A lot of the state houses were lost. Hospital and rest home residents had to be relocated throughout New Zealand. And of course, we had the schools that had to share sites after the event because some of the school closures and damage. We had very world record breaking and um, shaking intensity and the uh, records actually show that it was the veracity and velocity of the earthquakes that had such profound impacts on our infrastructure and the environment. The residential damage was unprecedented in the New Zealand landscape. We had sunken land, we had stormwater, and we had sewerage issues. We had massive flooding throughout the city. We had a lot of the commercial buildings and churches collapse. And as you can see, all of these photos that were taken in the central city just goes to show the extent of the damage and how widespread it was. So Red Cross was one of the first to respond and our intent is to be one of the last to leave. So we established our National Emergency Calm Center in Wellington and we had an emergency operations center here in Christchurch. 106 emergency response team volunteers from across New Zealand worked 6,800 hours in that response phase obviously over various um, shifts and rosters. 200 spontaneous volunteers actually did our data management and processing for all our welfare centers and the registrations. We had three welfare centers and 14 Red Cross delegates deployed in Christchurch. These are delegates that go around the world in times of crisis. So we had staff involved in the recovery from all around the country. Here's an example of some of our response equipment that we deployed at the time of the immediate response after the emergency. After response comes recovery. And what we're actually looking at is our principles in recovery that we guide all our work on. We try to use community-led approaches. We like effective coordination of all activities. We have to look at capacity building, particularly in the local community. We recognize the complexity of the recovery framework. We like to share, we analyze, and we imply quality information from what's happening in the community. We like to provide timely, fair, equitable, and flexible recovery services. And we primarily want to ensure vulnerability to disasters is not rebuilt. So we want to leave the communities stronger. <clears throat> so these are the phases in the recovery process that we know. Initially, immediately after the response, we have that altruistic, philanthropic feeling of heroism where we're all supporting families, friends, and neighbors for a common cause. Then we go into that honeymoon phase where we're actually looking at that sense of shared survival. We have a common story to tell. 
Then comes the complexity when we actually go into all of the normal grief cycle stages. We have disappointment, anger, frustration, disputes, particularly with faceless government agencies sometimes that we feel powerless with. We have the loss of support, um, be it from around other friends and family around the country or people who are having to address their own issues. We get exhausted. We have that sense of delusionment, uh, disillusionment. Sorry. Then what happens is you have groups that can actually weaken and fragment. We have a lot of obstacles and delays. And then after all of this begins the reconstruction phase. So as you can see, we have our psychosocial phases of recovery that match all the events. So what is Red Cross doing in that space? Well, we distributed clean water to 10,000 people. We had 12, 000, over 12,000 winter warmer packs delivered to households. We've had $125 million in donations, and we've had over 100,000 grant recipients. We also provide our outreach visits and community transport. We look at psychosocial workshops for workplace and community. We're supporting housing issues, particularly for vulnerable women and children, and looking at healthy home repairs. We're supporting various community groups to lead their recovery and build their capacity. We're supporting schools via a school children's grant, grant, social and youth workers in schools. And we're also supporting the All Right campaign. So right now we have some grants that we're still administering. We have youth workers in schools and social workers in schools. And this was our part to address the increased stresses that students have been enduring as a result of the earthquake and the secondary stressors because of the increased anxiety at home. We also have sorry, grants that are still available to homeowners. Independent advice grant is actually $750 to pay towards any independent advice that needs to be sought relating to an earthquake damaged property. So there's some examples of what those independent advice grants can go towards. And they are addressed to homeowners whose home at the time of the quakes is now either a red zone TC3 or assessed at over, a, over cap at $100,000 to repair. We have a pack and move grant for people who, homeowners and renters, who have to move from the red zone or for earthquake repairs or have to move for the third time since the earthquake or more. $750 to a registered moving company will assist with the pack and move costs. That's paid directly to the company, so a lot of communication is involved with that. We also have a storage grant for people who need to store their goods. We can actually pay up to $1,000 towards those storage costs. Um, there's a storage grant available for renters and homeowners. In the Christchurch School Children's Grant, we have given close to $7 million directly to schools. 179 schools were supported with over 61,000 students who have actually had a direct benefit. So you can see, we've actually put that money towards various things, including psychosocial support, individual hardship that students may be experiencing, supporting some new entrants and school leavers, the coping and resilience strategies, well-being events and activities, and anything else that was recommended by a specialist. An example would be some schools were able to actually go to um, Hamner for a break for the day, and some families said it was the first time that school children after the quakes I had a chance to get out of the city. So we also are offering Recovery Matters workshops. 
those recovery matters. We have community workshops that are 45 minutes to an hour. Or we actually have workplace workshops that will be three to four hours long. These are workshops around um, psychosocial supporting recovery mechanisms, either for community groups or businesses. We're also supporting bereaved families and seriously injured from the um, Canterbury earthquakes. The Royal Commission of Inquiry asked the Red Cross to look after the bereaved families. And so we do facilitated monthly support groups with these people. We have expert talks like Dr. Rob Gordon, the psychologist from Australia. We organize social events and we look at an annual retreat weekend. The seriously injured people, we also do expert talks and support groups for young people. And we're also looking at home energy checks to help those who want to get done by um, community energy action to have any healthy home initiatives. The goal is to provide the support for them to transition to be a self-managed group until June 2015. Our outreach program, these are the various phases that we explore through our outreach support process. We start by just basically being with the person. And that's about being the um, open ear or the shoulder to offer some support at times of duress. We look at their social connections. We try to get them involved in wider activities in the community. We will refer to expert agencies or give some um, existing agency support if needed. And then we try to give them practical support about what Red Cross can do. We also do recovery community transport. For people with limited mobility because either they physically cannot get to some place or they haven't got the access to transport mechanisms, we will provide transport options to get them either to medical appointments or to leisure and pleasure activities. We build a lot of partnerships with other organizations and here is a list of us trying to engage with existing community providers. Red Cross is not used to being in the community development space in a developed nation. We often support third world countries, but Christchurch offered a unique example of where we could partner with existing organizations to help them extend their reach. It wasn't our role to replace what they do, it's our role to support what they do. Volunteers, we are always on the lookout for more volunteers. Currently we have 30 active volunteers between the female and male. We have um, uh, an induction program first aid training, personal support training, and these volunteers act in a variety of capacities. They help drive our community transport. They do our outreach visits. They may do Meals on Wheels delivery. There's a range of activities for volunteers. We have a big focus on trying to help young people to actually increase their engagement in the recovery process. So we have the Address the Stress website, which is a youth-orientated uh, social media experience that we try to engage the youth to actually learn about recovery and learn about what they can do to help the recovery. Red Cross offers a lot of other programs across the city. We do fundraising, as you can see. We offer first aid training, both at the Red Cross and out in the community. We provide Meals on Wheels to um, residents all across Christchurch. We look at refugee assistance, and we do a lot of community education and promotion. 
So for the next two years in recovery, we are committed to recovery until um, the end of 2016. We are now in the fourth year of recovery. Dr. Rob Gordon tells us that people will be at various stages and a lot of fatigue and exhaustion will be in the community. We've developed a plan for our work in 2014 to 2016, much of which I've covered here today. And we're currently undergoing a lot of ongoing research to identify and respond to new needs as they arise. That gives you the overview of our different pillars in our recovery framework and our action plan. We look at individual well-being, community building, community partnerships, we're looking at advocacy, and looking to the future. How can we take the lessons we've learned through the Christchurch earthquakes and help other national societies and other countries in their recovery programs.